Good morning, Honey Ridge family, and to those who are joining us this morning. Let us read Psalm 63 together. O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches, because you have been my help. Therefore in the shadow of your wings I will rest. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. There shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory. But the mouth who speak lies shall be stopped. If you had to pick a single word to describe our society, perhaps the most accurate word would be pressure. We live in a day marked by pressure in almost every area of life. There are family pressures, finding the right mate, and building a solid marriage in a culture where divorce is easy and accepted. There are the pressures of raising godly children in our pagan society. World problems, economic problems, personal problems, and the problems of friends and loved ones all press upon us. In the midst of such pressures, there is one thing that will determine the course of your life, your priorities. Everyone has a set of priorities. If your priorities are not clearly defined, you will be swept downstream in life by various pressures, the seeming victim of your circumstances. But if your priorities are clear, then you can respond to your pressures by making choices in line with your priorities and therefore give direction to your life. Therefore, it is critical that you have the right priorities. Your priorities determine how you spend your time, with whom you spend your time, and how you make decisions. Your priorities keep you from being battered around by the waves of pressure and help you to steer a clear course towards the proper destination. Priorities, those are godly priorities, are crucial. Now King David was a man who knew what it meant to live under pressure. As the king of Israel, he knew the pressures of leadership. The higher and more responsible the leadership position, the greater are the pressures. And David knew the pressure of problems. During his reign, his son Absalom led a rebellion against him. David and his loyal followers had to flee for their lives. During that time, David spent a short while in the northeastern portion of the wilderness of Judah, before he crossed over the Jordan River. In that barren land, fleeing for his life from his own son, feeling disgraced and rejected, with an uncertain future, David penned Psalm 63. It is one of the most well-loved psalms. John Chrysostom, Archbishop of Constantinople, an important early church father, wrote, that it was decreed and ordained by the primitive church fathers that no day would pass without the public singing of the psalm. He also observed that the spirit and soul of the whole book of psalms is contracted into this psalm. In fact, the ancient church had the practice of beginning the singing of the psalms at each Sunday service with Psalm 63, called the Morning Hymn. Psalm 63 shows us the priority of this man of God under pressure. If you and I were under the same kinds of pressure David faced at this point of his life, I doubt we would be writing songs. If we did, the song would probably contain a lot of urgent requests. Help God! Get me out of here! David did write a song like that in Psalm 3, but it is interesting that Psalm 63 contains no petition. David expresses longing for God's presence, praise, joy, fellowship, God, and confidence in God's salvation. But there is no one word of asking for temporal or even spiritual blessings. The late scholar Derek Kidner outlines the Psalms as follows. Verses 1 to 4 is God my desire. Verses 5 to 8, God my delight. 
and verses 9 to 11, God my defense. The psalm shows us that David's priority was to seek the Lord. Seeking after God should be our most important priority. No matter what pressures come into your life, you will be able to handle them properly if you maintain this one priority above all else. Earnestly seek after God. I want to answer from Psalm 63 three questions about seeking after God. Number one, what does it mean to seek after God? Number two, what does the person look like who seeks after God? And number three, how does a person seek after God? We will endeavour to answer question one today and cover the next two questions tomorrow. So let's begin. Question one, what does it mean to seek after God? Psalm 63 allows us to peer into the heart of this man after God's own heart. It's an emotional psalm coming out of the depths of David's life, and it would be an injustice to pick the psalm apart while missing the feeling that it conveys. But while keeping the depth of feeling in mind, it is helpful to separate out three strands of what it means to seek after God. A. To seek after God means to have an intimate, personal relationship with God. We see that in verse 1, where he says, O God, you are my God. David knew God in an intimate, personal way. There is a vast difference between knowing about a person and actually knowing that person. You can learn a lot about President Trump. You can read news articles and books on his life. You can learn all about his personality, his personal habits and his family life. But he's still not the same as knowing him personally. To know the president personally would require an introduction or an occasion to meet and then spending hours with him over a long period of time in many situations. As the relationship developed, you would begin to discover more and more about the man, not from an academic standpoint, but as a close friend. That's how it must be with God, if you want to seek him. There must, you, there must have been a time where you met him personally through Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 17 verse 3, this is eternal life, that you may know you, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Your introduction to God comes when you turn from your sin to God and trust in Jesus Christ and his death on your behalf. He gives you eternal life as his free gift. And then you must develop your relationship by spending time with your new friend through weeks and months and years in a variety of situations. Seeking after God means you are seeking to develop an intimate relationship with God, whom you have met personally through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Point B. To seek after God, always to desire more of Him. David said, I shall seek you early. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh learns, yearns for you. Didn't David have the Lord? Well, yes, he did, because he calls Him my God. But he wanted more. He wanted to go deeper. He was satisfied, but he knew that there was more, and his whole being craved it as a thirsty man in the desert craves for water. The point is, to seek after God means to go after God with an intense desire. How much do you desire to know God? Well, A.W. Tozer wrote, Come near to the holy men and women of the past, and you will soon feel the heat of their desire after God. They mourned for him, they prayed and wrestled, and sought for him day and night, in season and out, and when they had found him, the finding was all the sweeter for the long seeking. Complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. So you see, to seek after God means that there is always more, because God is an infinite person. If you figure that you have reached a level of maturity in your Christian life, where you can put it in neutral and coast, well, you're in trouble. David had walked with God for years, but he thirsted for more. And that brings us to point C. To seek after God means to pursue God alone, to fill the vacuum in your life. David had fled from the throne. He left his possessions and his wives behind him. His own son, whom he loved, was attempting to kill him. And yet in all this, 
David wasn't seeking for any of those things to fill the vacuum in his life. He wasn't praying, Oh God, give me my wives back. Give me my palace back. Give me my kingdom back. But rather he prayed, I shall seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you. Your love is better than life. What an amazing statement. The fact is, it's easy to fill your life with things other than God. You may be good... They may be good things, but they are not God, and God alone can satisfy your soul. For example, many people fill their lives with family and friends. On Sunday, they usually give God an hour, but He isn't the center of their lives. People are. People are good, and relationships are a blessing from God, but we should try not to fill the vacuum in our lives with people, but rather with God. Others try to fill their lives with possessions or with a successful and satisfying career. Again, those things have their place, but they are not meant to satisfy your soul. God alone can do that. To seek Him means to pursue Him alone to fill that God-shaped vacuum in your life. Thus, seeking after God means to have an intimate, intimate, personal relationship with Him, always to desire more of Him and to pursue God alone to fill the vacuum in your life. Well, that's enough for today. Tomorrow we will continue with this psalm and answer the two remaining questions. I trust that you will have a great day reflecting on who God is and why you love Him.